Ok. <laughs> We're all set, I think. Okay. Um, well, I, I, I hope you can hear. Yes, just, uh, okay, F perfect. <laughs> thanks, Miguel, thanks for, th thanks for the tip. Well, um, welcome everyone. Uh, good evening or good night, uh, depending on, on the time zone, it's, it's, it's good night for me. My name is Teresa Sanego. I am based at the University of Santiago de Compostela in Spain. And uh, I've been asked to introduce this talk in my capacity as president of SLE, the Socitas Linguistica Europea. I, first of all, I would like to start by thanking Abrolin, the Brazilian Association for Linguistics, and most especially um, Miguel Oliveira, um, its, its president, uh, for this wonderful initiative and for bringing together so many different associations and linguists from all over the world. We've got uh, to know each other much better, uh, thanks to Abrolin, despite the pandemic or maybe because of the pandemic and otherwise our link would not have uh, taken place. Uh, several, I would like to say that several SLE members have already participated, have already given talks at Abrolin um, before this. Uh, they did so under the aus auspices of other associations and institutions and in the particular section which I am introducing now and which is sponsored by SLE, we will be listening to six different talks. The first is by Spike Gildi, and he will be on in a minute with a talk uh, on diachronic typology of alignment constructions, reanalysis versus analogical change. And um, a few days later, on the 6th of July, we will have Natalia Lerschina from the University of Jena, and she will talk on linguistic efficiency and information theory. On the 18th of July, um, we will have on uh, Ricardo Napoleon de Souza from Helsinki, and he will uh, lecture, uh, give a lecture in Portuguese, I guess, uh, to judge from its title, Tipologia Phonetica e Medidas de Complexidade. The 20, on the 22nd of July, um, uh, Teresa Biberauer will be on. She's from the University of Cambridge, and she will talk on emergent variation with reference to imperatives from a minimalist perspective. Uh, she will be followed uh, on the 23rd of July by Alex Bergs from Osnabrück, who will lecture on historical social linguistics. And um, the, the section for, for SLE speakers will be closed on the 24th of July by Esther Levkins from the University of Utrecht, who will talk on universal efficiency, different forms of violating the one form one meaning uh, principle. So as I said before, today's talk will be uh, by Spike Gildi. I wish to thank him on behalf, on behalf of SLE and on uh, behalf of Abrelin as well. And he will be introduced by Tila Cohen, who is now taking the floor. Thanks very much and good night. Good evening. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here tonight. I am Maria Antonieta Cohen from UFMG, the Federal University of Minas Gerais in Belo Horizonte. Recently retired as a professor in Romance, Philology and Linguistics, but still linked to the program of postgraduate studies in linguistics as a volunteer. Uh, my main area of interest has been historical linguistics with a special focus on language change and all the processes that come with it, including change 
that occur in both minority and endangered languages. First of all, I'd like to congratulate the board of directors of Abralin that together with various international linguistic associations from Latin America, Spain, France, Great Britain, USA, and Australia have launched many important projects in recent times and thank them for this fortunate initiative, Abralin Ao Vivo, calling us together, linguists not only from Brazil, but from all around the world. I'd like to introduce Professor Spike Gildia, Professor in Linguistics at the University of Oregon, USA, head of the Department of Linguistics in the same institution. He's published theses, books, and journal articles, many of them on historical and comparative analysis and methodology of, of reconstructing grammar. He's also a serious co-editor for typological studies in language. His primary interests are description and documentary fieldwork, historical, functional, and typological syntax, as well as historical and functional phonology. He has worked in South America with 15 languages of the Caribbean family, and also we are the language outside this family. In his own words, he continues to be fascinated by the diachronic typology of main clause alignment patterns, the chosen topic for his speech tonight, called diachronic alignment constructions, reanalysis versus analogical change. So thank you so much, Professor Gildia, for being with us. Please, please feel free to start your speech now. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for that kind introduction. Thank you to Abraline and to, uh, to um, uh, the Societas Linguistica Europea for uh, uh, making it possible for me to do this, um, to do this talk. And let me see if I can share my screen. Ah, I have shared my dog. Let's see, swap displays. Okay, is this now working? No, which one are you seeing? The wrong one. Aha, okay, so I need to switch back. Okay, is this now working? Yes, thank you. Okay, beautiful. So uh, before I dive into the actual topic of this, uh, talk, I would like to say some other thank yous. Uh, as you will see from multiple references in this talk, I owe a, a real debt to uh, an intellectual and friendship debt to some colleagues that I've worked with. Uh, Joanna Barthdahl, Fernando Zuniga, Frances Queixalos, and Flavia de Castro Alves uh, will come up multiple times during this talk. Uh, that's not to imply that they actually will agree with anything I'm saying here, but Nonetheless, I, I've been inspired by working with them over the years, and thank you. I also want to pass greetings to friends and colleagues from the world of indigenous linguistics in South America, in Brazil, especially at the Museo Paraense Emilio Gelgi, that gave me my first opportunity to work in Brazil, and the uh, Núcleo de Tipologia at Universidade de Brasília, where I've been working with people more recently, and uh, in Europe, just all of my colleagues from the world of typology and historical linguistics, uh, greetings. And um, let me now turn to the talk itself. Hmm. If it will let me, here we go. So today's talk uh, is organized primarily around the introduction. As you'll see, it's uh, uh, mostly introduction and fast. I want to make sure that we all agree on what alignment typology is, uh, explain what I mean by constructions, and then get into the heart of the issue of mechanisms of grammatical change. 
Uh, after illustrating all of that, we'll have a quick look through reanalysis as a source of innovative alignment patterns and analogy as a source of innovative alignments or alignment patterns within existing constructions, and then some programmatic conclusions. As you'll see, much of this is organizing what I'm hoping to see as a future research paradigm. So first, a quick introduction to those who aren't familiar with my work. Um, I've primarily, I began my work with language description and documentation, primarily focused on within Amazonia, the Caribbean language family, which you see in the map here. Um, I have done my own field work in Venezuela, Brazil, and Guyana. I've additionally been working for years on historical linguistics, where I've done some reconstruction of phonology and lexicon, but much more reconstruction of syntax. And so you see my 98 book and a book that I edited in 2000 here. Um, I also have a deep engagement with typological linguistics from a functional perspective. Uh, looking at things like alignment, such as ergativity in Amazonia, clause types, such as nonverbal predication in Amazonian languages, voice, which I have not got a, a edited volume on. And, and then I also work in construction grammar, uh, and in particular in diachronic construction grammar. And uh, these two volumes sort of represent that approach um, uh, from the perspective of myself and my colleagues. Uh, I should note, uh, none of this is really grammaticalization, properly speaking, and that will become important later. So heading on into the introductions to the main topics, what is alignment typology from my perspective? And I recognize that this is not the perspective that all people who work in alignment typology have. So I want to introduce you to what I'm talking about when I say it so that uh, whether you agree or don't agree, at least we won't be confused because you think it means something different from what I think it means. Mm -hmm. So alignment is something that's dependent on valence, which is the number of core syntactic arguments. Uh, an intransitive or monovalent has a single argument, the S. A bivalent uh, or transitive clause has two arguments, the A and the P. Um, there are at least three different schools that define what these mean. I primarily work within uh, the approach that Comrie and Dreyer have developed. Hospelmoth 2011 kind of explains the differences in a way that uh, works pretty well for me. Um, within this, I see certain alignment types that I want to focus on. One is the nominative accusative in which the transitive subject and the intransitive single argument or the transitive more agent-like argument have the same grammatical treatment. That is, they align and they're opposed to the P, which is the accusative. Uh, in contrast to that, there's the ergative absolutive in which the agent-like argument of the transitive clause has different grammatical treatment from the patient-like argument, which is identical to the, uh, or which shares patterns with the single argument of an intransitive clause. Semantic alignment is a term that was introduced uh, by Donahue and Wichmann in 2008. Um, it's also been called lexical predicate-based, active stative, split S, non-canonical A or P, um, and in this one, the most typical is to have uh, uh, the agent-like argument of the transitive clause patterned with the, a subset of the intransitive single arguments. The patient-like argument of a transitive clause would pattern with a subset of the single arguments of intransitive clauses. And the subset is usually determined by the lexical verb or conditioned by the verb. Sometimes it's conditioned by, by uh, uh, more live semantic uh, distinctions, but it's not frequent. And I do include non-canonically marked A and P in this, uh, in this sort of alignment type. Final one I call hierarchical alignment. It's not really organized around A, S, and P, but more around which argument is of, uh, call it primary topicality, which would be the proximate argument, as opposed to the reduced salience or topicality argument, which would be the obviative argument, primarily relevant for transitive clauses. I've given here the hierarchy that is said to often condition it. Um, so I won't talk too much about the last two, although I will talk some about them. Um, but before we get into examples of the types, we need to ask the question, how do we know one alignment from another? 
Um, the things you're looking for are what they call overt coding properties, and that's within a given construction or a given clause, there are a set of things that you can just see. And these are the things that uh, you'd say are most likely to be utilized in helping to decide who did what to whom. There are also covert syntactic properties, some within a single construction, like control of reflexive morphology, and some when you compare between related constructions like active and passive, you know, can you passivize a given active clause and if so, what happens? Um, so looking at those overt coding properties, the first one that uh, I'll be pointing out is flagging, which is sometimes called dependent marking, and that includes case marking, clitics that are case-like, ad positions, things that mark an argument. Uh, indexation is a second type. That would be the head marking uh, uh, morphology, which includes, say, agreement with verb or auxiliary, second position clitics, sometimes initial or final clitics, all of these attested in the languages uh, of Brazil. Um, and then order of core arguments vis-a-vis -vis the verb. Um, so quick examples of this, nominative accusative, English is a stereotypical language that does this, in which you'd say the S of the verb run patterns with the A of the verb C. And so you can say case in the preverbal order of S and A align, and then the case and postverbal order of P is something distinct. Um, similarly, indexation aligns S and A in that the third person singular present tense suffix agrees with the S of the intransitive verb run, and it agrees with the A of the transitive verb C. In the ergative absolutive, where you have the different pattern, I will select Cuicuro, a Caribbean language of Brazil, uh, described in multiple articles by Bruno Franchetto. Um, so here you see that flagging and the preverbal order of S and P are what aligns. So the S arrow of the verb go has no marking and it comes before the verb. The P, kanga, kanga uh, is unmarked, and, oh, sorry, the P of the verb eat is unmarked and comes before the verb. And so that is alignment of S and P. In contrast, the flagging and the postverbal order of the A is distinct. Um, covert syntactic properties would be constituency. Uh, so VP, the verb phrase distinguishes the direct object, which is a P, but sometimes it distinguishes S being equal to P. So everyone's familiar with the verb phrase from European languages. I'll give you an example here from Makushi, a Caribbean language spoken in Northern Brazil and Southern Guyana. So here you can see that the verb, a purupu, find, takes its pre-verbal argument inside the verb phrase. There are multiple syntactic tests for this status. Um, and so you have the expected object verb verb phrase. However, it also happens with intransitive verbs. The single argument of the intransitive verb is not only unmarked like the P, but it actually forms a verb phrase with the verb uh, uh, go home. So Jaguar went to his house. So this would be a case where syntactic property of constituency actually identifies the absolutive as the relevant uh, uh, category. Control properties are situations where you have one argument that controls co-reference. Usually that's the subject, occasionally other arguments. The target of co-reference then could be a myriad of things depending on the construction. Subject could be object, could be a possessor, could be a reflexive marker. In this case, uh, we're gonna look at it as a possessive reflexive marker in those same two examples from Makushi. So if you look at uh, this example of the verb find, the A argument, ya, controls co-reference with that reflexive prefix on the direct object, tunmu, that tu says the son belonging to whoever the A is. So the translation is the man found his own son, not the son of some other person. If you look at the intransitive verb, now you see that the single argument of the intransitive verb, kaikusi, the jaguar, actually, even though it does not share morphological properties with the, um, with the A, and it does not share uh, order properties or constituency properties with the A, it does share the property of control of that co-referential, that uh, reflexive possessor prefix, tu, as in tewu. So now it's Jaguar went to his own house and not 
conceivably the house of anyone else. Behavior properties are mappings between participants of active clauses and say passives, anti-passives, relative clauses, nominalizations. Um, these are more complex and I'm gonna avoid talking about those today uh, because you need to actually know the history of both constructions and how they relate. I don't think of them as a synchronic derivational relationship. Um, in thinking about alignment, there are a couple of things that make alignments not always consistent. Now, nominative accusative is commonly consistent, but ergative absolutive almost never is. If it were totally consistent, then it would be the so-called deep ergative, of which there are very few. So it's typical for flagging to be ergative and everything else to be accusative, as in the example of Matzes spoken in a Panoan language spoken in Peru. Um, it's less typical, but found the example of Makushi, where flagging, indexation, and word order uh, all are ergative, but the control of co-reference is accusative. Um, there is an extreme case in Katukina, which is uh, uh, also spoken in Brazil, in which indexation, order, control, and behavior all show ergative patterning, but there are some behaviors that have an accusative pattern, and there are some constructions that condition non-ergative alignment. So it's still not completely consistent. The closest we have to a completely consistent is the classic uh, gerbal grammar from Dixon 1972, in which everything is on the ergative side of the uh, uh, divide. Semantic alignment is also typically inconsistent in that the semantic based flagging and or indexation can be determined by the verb, but order and control usually are uh, accusative control. Um, so uh, the second type of inconsistency is what Dixon calls split alignment or split ergativity and what Zuniga 2018 calls conditioned, which is a term I prefer because split sort of suggests that you're dividing something that was originally unified. And in fact, what we have here are things that come from different sources and then you have to choose which one to use based on some conditioning factor. So ergative alignment would be conditioned by past tense, perfective aspect, some non-agent oriented modalities. Accusative alignment would be conditioned by non-past tense, imperfective aspect, agent oriented modalities. So that gets us to the question of why do we need to talk about constructions? Quick definition of construction. I use the definition from construction grammar. There's a vol voluminous literature. So I'm not going to uh, uh, go deeply into this, let's say constructions are pairings of form and meaning, and as such are the fundamental building blocks of language from the atomic, which would be morphemes, to the complex, which would be entire stretches of discourse that are conventionalized. So Croft and Cruz 2004 give, among others, these five examples, and I want to focus on a morpheme being atomic and substantive, a very limited kind of construction, a syntactic category still being atomic, it's a single entity, but now it's schematic. It doesn't necessarily have something, it's like a slot in a larger construction. And that larger construction would be something like the syntax of a clause, which is complex, has multiple slots and some substantive pieces, but primarily it's schematic. So with that as the basis, the diachronic questions would be, how do constructions get consistent alignment, those that have them? How do constructions get inconsistent alignment? And then how do these alignment splits or these conditioned alignments come into being? The diachronic questions turn to how questions suggest you need to know about mechanisms and processes. So you'd wanna know what mechanisms or processes create alignments in innovative construction. So if you develop a new construction, where does its alignment come from? And then once you have a construction, you can make changes inside that construction. What kinds of mechanisms or processes change alignment in existing constructions? For me, this is gonna be the difference between uh, the two mechanisms that I wanna talk about today, reanalysis and analogical extension or an analogy. So reanalysis is defined in multiple publications. Langacker had the first one, change in the structure of an expression or class of expressions that does not involve any change in its surface manifestation. In other words, the speaker sees it as something different while continuing to say it exactly as it has been said. So it changes underlying structure for Harrison Campbell. 
uh, without modifying the surface manifestation. Um, this has been recast as neo-analysis in Traugott and Trousdale's more recent work. So for me, you could think of it as one kind of a construction, which is usually a marked construction, like a passive or an anti-passive, a cleft, it gets reinterpreted by speakers as some other kind of construction that's usually more basic as say an active monoclausal construction. For example, a passive might become a new main clause coding a perfective, which then becomes a past tense value. Uh, Reanalysis is a mechanism that splits. It, it creates new constructions by splitting them from their source constructions. It also creates new constructions by merging multiple source constructions into a single construction. So here's an example of reanalysis as a split taken again from English, although well, I'm doing it so I can go faster. There are multiple examples of this in languages of South America as well. Locative predicates could locate an agent in an act in 12th and 13th century English, like there he was on slurting, so there he was on hunting. They were at robbing, and there he was in hunting. Now, what's interesting here is that these, this construction is not conventionalized. There are three different prepositions that could serve in this locative slot. Don't know what the difference was at the time, but when it becomes a productive construction, it conventionalizes with a single preposition on. And then that preposition begins to reduce to un, the a, uh, a, uh, the un, well, on, an, a, uh, and then it disappears altogether. So you find examples like now, while I am a writing of this letter and I am doing of my needings, it's gone altogether. And this was still in the 15th century. So this kind of change accompanies monoclausal reanalysis. It's no longer seen as this biclausal construction with a predicate and a nominalization. It's now a monoclausal uh, progressive construction. This is an example of a split in that the source predicate locative construction is still there, hasn't changed at all, but the integrative progressive has split off to become a new construction that marks aspect. Now we can take this and say, what are the implications for alignment? When you create something from a locative construction, the S of the locative predicate, which is the S of the copula in English, now will be the S and A of the reanalyzed clause. So John Cheney is out a hawking and I am doing of my needings, the is and a am reflect agreement now with the nominative, not simply with the intransitive S of a copula. And the P, the direct object, has this unique pattern in which it's now flagged with the preposition of coming historically from a possessive, a possessive marker, a genitive marker. So I am doing of my needings. Thus reanalysis created new alignment patterns in the verb indexation, which remains vital today, and the genitive flagging became accusative flagging, and then that new accusative flag was dropped by the 1800s, a kind of analogical change called um, adjustment, which we'll talk about shortly. So why do reanalyses happen? Um, seems to be the motivation has a couple of different factors. One is semantic. It is a way to further specify more refined semantic distinctions or new semantic distinctions, or it's a more newsworthy way to express an existing semantic distinction. It's the new cool way to say something that ends up replacing the old boring old people way of saying something. Um, so what's important here is that the motivation for reanalysis is in the meaning or use of the entire construction. It's not restricted to the meanings of individual morphemes. In fact, those morphemes are not so important it's the construction that matters in reanalysis. In contrast, an analogy is something that involves changing the surface form of a given construction, but it doesn't create a new construction. It changes an existing construction and it doesn't lead to a split. The old one doesn't still exist. It just is the new construction. So you change surface collocations. And this has been called analogization in Traugott and Trousdale. So I have four types of analogy uh, that I'm talking about. I'm not sure that I would defend that these are the only four or that it's necessary to divide them in this way, but they've been useful for me and that's why I do it. So reduction or adjustment, the 
expansion or host class expansion, extension, moving something, call it borrowing between constructions, and contact-induced change, which is borrowing between constructions that happen to belong to different languages. So reduction or adjustment is loss of forms in the innovative construction, and this often happens after a reanalysis. So for example, in the English progressive, you had I am on doing of my needings. The on and the of can both just drop out because they're kind of redundant. You don't need them to uh, communicate the information in question. Uh, Heine refers to this as adjustment and distinguishes it from phonological erosion, which is a different kind of reduction entirely. Um, I've done some work with Geraldine Walter that talks about inherited forms with a low functional load can just drop out of use. And so that's an example. The on and of would have had low functional load and they simply erode very quickly. Expansion is a situation where you begin a construction with a relatively limited domain where it can operate and then new lexical items enter and it expands. Himmelmann in 2004 calls this host class expansion. Um, Heine, uh, uh, Claudia and Hunemeyer talk about this as a form of metaphorical thinking. Uh, Joanna Barthdahl talks about this as a way of increasing productivity and Barthdahl and Gilde talk about it as an increase of schematicity. This is how you make a construction more general is by expanding the situations where you can use it. So another, once again, you see why I chose the example of the English uh, progressive. Uh, this is an example of expansion. Uh, so originally it only occurred with activity verbs that had a stereotypical location. So it would answer the question, hey, Where's the, where's the queen? Well, she's on praying, and now you know where she is because there's a place where she would be doing this. It expands to accomplishments and then to achievements as it becomes a true progressive. At this point, it loses its association to location, and then finally, it can expand to states. Um, this doesn't create a new construction, but that existing construction gets much richer. This is one of the things that happens as something is reanalyzed, it can expand. Uh, greatly in its use. Extension is, according to Harrison Campbell, uh, the mechanism that, well, it's, they give the same definition as analogy, but what I think of it as is you take a form like a case marker, an agreement prefix, or a pattern like word order, control a coreference from an existing construction and you borrow it into another construction. And that would be a case where you extend it from one to another. So an example of this would be the Caravan Progressive from my 98 book in chapter 12. The transitive progressive looks just like the English example, a nominalized verb and a locative predicate. The notional object would be the possessor, the P. After reanalysis, that nominalization becomes a main verb. The copula becomes an auxiliary. And in two languages, Apalai and Kachuyana, the verbal plural marker that only occurs with finite verbs throughout the family is extended to these innovative transitive progressive verbs only. No other nominalizations get this. And uh, now even the same nominalizations or the source nominalizations for this progressive do not get this uh, verbal plural marker. Only the ones that have been reanalyzed get it. So that would be a case of extension from one construction to another. Contact induced change would be by analogy to another language system. So you can borrow a morpheme, you can calc a grammatical pattern, you can replicate a pattern using native morphology as it were um, in the innovative use of a native construction pattern on use in a contact language. And Marianne Mathune has two really nice papers on this uh, in the creation of uh, hierarchical systems from passives in both the Northwestern US and in Northern Canada. Uh, also, Eitan Grossman has examples of all of this in his 2018 paper. Uh, so summary, these fundamental mechanisms are the ones that introduce innovative alignments, replace prior alignments, and either build or break down the consistency of alignments within constructions. And these mechanisms have different effects in alignment change. So constructions are not only the locus of alignment patterns, but they're also the locus of alignment change. Alignment needs to be more, you need to think of it as more than the grammaticalization of individual morphemes like flagging morphemes or indexation morphemes. There are lots of morphosyntactic patterns involved 
and each individual morpheme fits into something larger. That larger whole is the construction. And entire constructions change by reanalysis, all of them change at once, and individual components of a construction change by analogy. And those are the smaller scale changes that uh, often get tracked. If you keep those separate, things become much clearer. For a quick case study in the importance of keeping this separate, let's have a look at the source of ergative case markers from uh, Heiko Narog's article, um, um, chapter uh, in 2014 of, of, well, in the references. So the generalizations that were made from grammaticalization studies that focused on the morpheme level asked the question, which source morphemes become which resultant grammatical markers. So Heine et al. in 91 said, well, spatial morphemes begin to apply to humans, for example, as datives or, or agent phrases, but then they can apply to inanimate things. So there's a natural hierarchical progression. Yamaguchi in 2004 adds a bunch of detail. And this is a complex diagram. What's important is to see that there are four different spatial temporal domains source, path, location, and goal. And each of those can extend uh, into non-spatial or temporal domains, becoming say agentive, instrumental, possessive, benefactive. And all of these things seem to be consistent in their directionality. But then Narog went deeper and he found a series of changes that were predicted not to occur in which instruments and possessors become agents causes and conditions become purposes and agents. And he said, how did this happen? And when he looked more closely, he discovered that the counter examples to the predictions of that people made focusing on single morphemes and how individual morphemes change all came about as a part of reanalyzed constructions where it wasn't the morpheme that changed, it was the construction that changed and the morpheme just happened to be in the construction. So ergative alignment, typically arises as a part of reanalyzed constructions. And you can see that when the passive becomes say the past perfective as I believe it has for Indic, the agent of passive becomes the ergative as a part of that change without there being a necessary motivation for the oblique to become a subject. Possessive predicates, it's a similar thing because possessive predicate becomes a possessive perfect that's common throughout Europe but when the possessor is non-canonical, a dative marked subject, that then can give rise to an ergative subject in the reanalyzed construction. Uh, uh, Steven Anderson in 77 suggested this happened for Iranian. Uh, Haig 2008 has a more nuanced view that suggests it was more complicated. Uh, more recent example, Sara Pakiroti's article on Chibchan um, suggests that this can happen in a more direct way as well. Nominalizations can become main clauses, the phenomenon that Nick Evans calls insubordination, in which the possessor becomes the absolutive in the Carabin family, all of my previous work, and the Jay family with Flavia's work on uh, uh, her article in 2010 in IJAL. The possessor uh, becomes the ergative in Tibeto Burman, as uh, Delancey 2011 has shown. So when you ask the question, is the source form motivated? Well, if the ergative marker is part of a new construction, and the construction is changing for reasons of constructional semantics, then the form of the ergative marker, marker is not motivated by the semantics of whatever that marker used to be in the unreanalyzed construction. It just is motivated that the entire construction makes the change. And there are clear examples where the forms cannot be motivated by their semantics. There are four different lines here in which genitive becomes a different core argument. It can become the ergative in tibeto burman the nominative in Karabin, the absolutive in Karabin, and the accusative in progressives all over, including both English and Karabin. And the word thing, the lexical item meaning thing, became a non-canonical possessor in a possessive predicate in Chibchan, which then went on to become an ergative. And I don't think anyone would argue that thing is a likely semantic antecedent for an ergative marker. So that said, it is the case that a number of the source forms are semantically motivated by analogical extensions that took place in the creation of the source construction before reanalysis. So it's not uncommon to find 
agent of passive coming from a source or a path or an instrument marker. It's not uncommon to find a dative as the non-canonical subject of a possessive predicate or to find the dative becoming the causee of a causative via a reanalysis and then being shifted to become the oblique agent of other constructions as arguably happened in the Carabin family. Later analogical extensions can also replace an older eroded ergative marker. Uh, and for example, locative and ablative marker can become an ergative in Kuikuro in Carabin, and the instrumental has become the ergative in Indic uh, after the erosion of the older uh, oblique uh, A marker. So my conclusion to the introduction is that if we want to understand diachronic typology, we have to distinguish the mechanisms of change that create our synchronic typology. Reanalysis is where you're going to have new constructions being born and they will bring innovative alignment patterns to main clauses. They don't have to be, the individual morphemes don't have to be semantically motivated. However, the changes are strongly directional. Nominalizations become main clauses, vice versa is, is quite rare. Analogical extension, new morphemes or patterns are imported into existing main clause constructions. Uh, these are motivated by analogical thinking, which means semantic connections. And analogical changes don't need to be directional because analogy can be as flexible as the human mind is. So you can't predict what directions these kinds of changes are gonna go. So over halfway into the talk, we have now concluded the introduction. Uh, as you can tell, this is a huge topic and I'm not going to speak that much longer today. So that means the remainder of this talk is somewhat programmatic. Call it a promissory note for a future volume, uh, which I would love to have people collaborate with me on. Um, the next component of this talk is to examine reanalysis as a source of innovative alignments. And let's start with the basic one. Nominative accusative is ubiquitous in the languages of the world. And as you might expect, there are a lot of ways to get it, including reanalysis of possessive perfects into past perfectives in Germanic and Romance, many European languages, in which the A, the transitive subject of the verb have, becomes the nominative after the reanalysis. Locative predicates, as I've already showed, become progressives and go on to become imperfectives in many languages of the world. And the S of that locative predicate becomes the nominative of the reanalyzed construction. When an anti-passive becomes an imperfective main clause, the S of the anti-passive becomes a nominative because it will become the A of the new transitive construction and the S of the old intransitive construction will still behave the same way. So you're creating an alignment between S and the innovative A. Nominalizations frequently uh, uh, create nominative accusative alignment when they're possessed by the notional S or A, that genitive S or A becomes the nominative. And when they're possessed by the notional P, that genitive becomes the accusative, as we saw in the examples of the progressive. Um, there are more, and because it's so frequent, I'm just gonna skip on to the less known and less attested examples. Reanalysis as a source of ergative absolutive alignment. I already presented several of these a few slides ago. To these, we could add the instrument becomes ergative reanalysis in which an inanimate instrumental oblique, something like uh, you have a sentence like, he opened the door with the key, but he is not explicitly used in the grammar of the construction. It's a so-called prodrop language. So just open the door with the key. And then there is a reinterpretation of with the key as the subject, but now it's a marked subject. With the key opens the door, meaning the key opens the door. And this then can expand to other A arguments as argued in Garrett's 1990 article. Um, and well, you can look up the references later on. Um, Reanalysis as a source of semantic alignment is, uh, shall we say, less developed. Um, there are one example is where light or compound verbs can become a new class of basic intransitive, like um, I do sleeping uh, or I do uh, running. Uh, and then I do running, do being a transitive verb, the I now has the marker of the A and 
if the do running gets reanalyzed as a single lexical item, uh, it is now an active intransitive verb. And so if running is the main verb, now you have an S of A class. Uh, transitive experiencer object verbs, uh, the experiencer object like, that scares me. And then you just go, scares me. And scares me now means I get scared. Uh, and that has me marked as a P, but now it's for an intransitive subject. Uh, inalienable property nouns have become uh, S of P predicates, arguably in Tupi, Warani, and J, the descriptive verbs, as they call them. Some people argue that those are still nouns synchronically, but I think I've seen convincing evidence for reanalysis, which uh, will be fun to put in a chapter of such a book. And in the Carabin family, middle voice became a new class of basic intransitives, and the new verb class, the middle, the middle voice had a marking on the single argument, and now that they are basic intransitive verbs, they have a marking, and so you have a split intransitive system. Um, ah, reanalysis as a source of hierarchical alignment would be the situation where. Um, uh, well, there's several. Uh, Fernando Zuniga and I uh, uh, wrote an entire article on this, uh, but the passive gets reanalyzed as inverse, leaving the active to be the direct or the anti-passive to be direct. This is attested in multiple North American languages. Um, there is the cislocative becoming the inverse. In other words, it acts, an act happens towards me or it happens towards you, but it just happens third person. And so there's special markers when uh, the P is either you or me, the speech act participant, and that becomes an inverse marker in the hierarchy. So that was our article from 2016. Um, additionally, there are cases where simply for, for reanalysis of indexing is hierarchical, a zero third person marker can be reanalyzed as not there, leaving it so that only the speech act participant is indexed, whether it's the A indexed when it's high on the hierarchy or the P indexed when it's high on the hierarchy. And this would be uh, all of the languages listed here, um, or the language families. Um, the final way that reanalysis creates hierarchical alignment is the hierarchical system of Movima, uh, which uh, Katarina and I uh, talked about in 2011. Uh, in this case, there was one construction, which was the patient focus. It's me that you hit. Uh, that evolved into a direct verb and uh, the agent focus, it is I who hit you or it's me who hit you um, becomes the inverse. And the, um, well, let's stop right there because what I'm trying to do is run through a list quickly. And uh, the final one on this list is to show that there are some situations like in Sahapton where there are four or five different complex hierarchical patterns, each coming from a different source, each arguably the result of reanalysis that brought them into a new kind of construction. So what's important about reanalysis creating all of these new alignments? They create new constructions which may replicate existing alignment patterns, but they may also introduce new alignment patterns. And in that case that they introduce new alignment patterns, they may replace the prior alignment patterns, or they may result in a conditioned uh, uh, alignment pattern in which, for example, the innovative past tense is, has ergative alignment and the conservative non-past tense has nominative accusative alignment. And now you have the so-called split or the conditioned alignment. Um, oh, and that's what I was just talking about. So, Reanalysis creates consistent alignment patterns in the situation that I was talking about alignment patterns where maybe indexing is one kind of alignment, but flagging is a different kind of alignment, or maybe flagging and indexing are one kind, but control properties are a different kind within a single construction. Early after reanalysis, you have the most consistent alignment patterns. You see argument flagging, verbal indexation, order, syntactic control properties, they all reflect a single alignment pattern. And that's where you get consistent alignments like deep ergativity. Then analogical change can come in and introduce inconsistent patterns one at a time. 
And that then creates the phenomenon of morphological ergativity. And so the first change that we see in Karabin and Indic is the controller of coreference switches from the absolutive, meaning the P of a transitive verb, to the nominative, meaning the absolutive S of an intransitive verb and the ergative A of a transitive verb share control of coreference. Then you see order changing in which the absolutive verb ergative order changes to accusative verb nominative in panare or to nominative verb accusative in ikpeng. Um, and then you see verbal indexation shifting from absolutive to nominative in indic leaving only case marking as the final exponent of the ergative pattern. Um, uh, there is a generative account of the changes I was just talking about in Polinsky. I read about this uh, in Sunyaka's article on, um, on diachrony of alignment. And I am looking forward to finding out uh, what exactly would test the generative version of this hypothesis, because it looks really interesting. Turning now to uh, the final component, the analogy as a source of changes to existing alignments. Um, because analogy usually just changes one pattern or morpheme at a time, modifying an existing construction, it's more easily organized according to the type of pattern that changes rather than the type of alignment that is created or changed. Um, and so here, what I'm gonna do is focus on flagging. Um, the first typical analogical change is just loss of ergative case, which can either become nominative if the S is unmarked and the loss of ergative case leaves the A unmarked and the B develops marking, or it can create a neutral pattern where the absolutive was unmarked and now the, uh, now the A is unmarked as well and you simply don't have distinctive flagging anymore. So Esteval and Myhill give multiple examples, uh, more recent examples from South America, Guillaume uh, documents this for Takana, uh, Roberto Zariquier for Isconawa, and uh, in my work with Flavio Castro Alves, uh, we document something similar for two languages in Northern Zhe, both uh, uh, Chimbira and um, um, I don't know how to say it, Suya, uh, Kiseji, uh, I'm guessing on the vowels. Um, you can also see analogy as a source to uh, innovate new flagging patterns. So the extension of case markers is typical and Harris and Campbell give multiple examples in which you have a pair of constructions which have different flagging patterns and you take the marker from one and you move it to the other one. And in this way, you get a consistent alignment pattern by analogy. Uh, similarly, you have the extension of uh, ergative case to the A of innovative negative clauses in Matzes, Dave Flex thesis in 2003. And you have the extension of ergative A to agentive S, meaning the S of A category in both Tibetan and Austronesian. Analogy uh, also uh, shows up in the form of expansion of verbs that use say non-canonical subject and object flagging. Uh, so in Icelandic, we have the extreme case documented in Joanna Barthdahl's book on productivity in 2008 in Germanic, Barthdahl and Athorson's uh, recent article uh, shows that you have the expansion of a dative subject pattern to verbs that used to be nominative accusative in a couple of verbs in particular. And Eleanor Coghill's work on Aramaic shows a similar situation in which a dative subject verb, actually that construction expands to all verbs and then you develop an ergative from this. Um, also, there are a lot of studies on the dative becoming differential accusative, becoming accusative. Uh, Giorgio Yemelo's thesis in 2013 gives multiple examples. Uh, in an article I recently did with Joanna Jansen, uh, we found that Nez Perce is a language that, uh, a Sahaptian language that has taken that change all the way to where uh, all accusatives are marked with what was etymologically the dative marker. Um, so at either the first or the last day stage, this must involve some reanalysis and the speakers start to think of that dative marked argument as an object or a direct object rather than an indirect object, if you will. Let's see, we also see reinforcement of existing case patterns. I talked about this earlier in Indic where they renovate the ergative marker with more semantically transparent selections that are brought in to replace the old uh, eroded oblique marker. Um, there is the 
argument, the proposal's been made that the Shina uh, borrowed an ergative marker from Tibeto Burman. Um, it's not clear that that was a rigorous reconstruction, but to the extent that this is possible, we should be able to see it. Um, in other alignment patterns, just quick examples to show that you can apply this same way of thinking here. Um, indexation, uh, you can extend indexation patterns from one construction to another. So in the example I gave from the Caribbean progressive earlier, there were main clause finite verbs that marked the plural of a speech act participant with a verbal morpheme, a verbal suffix. That got extended to the main verb of the progressive construction, which is etymologically a nominalization. No nominalizations would take that marker. So you extend uh, an index indicating uh, a plural participant. In another branch of Caravan, the Picodian, the entire hierarchical prefix set, okay, I said in 2012, the entire hierarchical prefix set was extended into all subordinate clauses in uh, Picodian. Uh, what Florian Mater has shown in recent work uh, is that in fact, all except the third person were extended into these uh, subordinate clauses in the Picodian branch. And that has led to some really interesting uh, new kinds of alignment splits. Um, in terms of constituent order, uh, uh, Grossman's 2018 article shows Coptic changing constituent order based on influence from ancient Greek. I believe we could also talk about the example of, um, uh, ah, I'm not gonna make it up on the fly, sorry. Uh, we also have clear examples of analogy for control of co-reference. So when a passive becomes a past tense, the absolutive controls co-reference, and that's clearly attested in a source construction. After it's reanalyzed, it remains the case for a period of time. And then one by one, the control of co-reference pass from the absolutive to the reanalyzed ergative. In Karitnya, only the control of the reflexive possessive morpheme passes to the A. Control of interclausal co-reference remains with the absolutive B. But in TDO, both of them have transferred over to the innovative, what was once an oblique A. So you see analogy also as a driver of changes in control of co-reference. So that runs through kind of a quick menu, more like a table of contents than an actual list of arguments. So let's get to the conclusions and see where we go from here. So the main takeaway that I hope to have convinced you of in this talk is that if you want to do diachronic typology, you need to understand the mechanisms of change. If you want to know why grammatical constructions have the patterns they do, you need to know the kinds of mechanisms that create those kinds of patterns. So it is the case that many kinds of alignment change are not attested. Uh, we only know about them from syntactic reconstruction. Um, it's also the case that rigorous reconstruction requires knowledge of directionality. Mechanisms are what help us to identify directionality for the purposes of reconstruction in that reanalyses have consistent directionality. If you can identify the source, if you can identify two cognate constructions, it's not difficult to know the source in which is the reanalyzed um, uh, innovative construction. Analogical changes are not similarly directional. So you need to work way there. Well, the argument for uh, reanalyses having cons consistent directionality, I first made it in 1998. And the argument that this is critical to a rigorous way of reconstructing syntax comes from the introduction to this volume, which was written by, uh, the introduction was by uh, uh, me and, um, uh, Professor Luhan and Joanna Barthol. Um, so if we can depart from this knowledge of these different mechanisms, that can make reconstruction of syntax far less speculative, which is an attack it's consistently subject to. Uh, this allows us to be far more precise than typical 
grammaticalization stories that we hear that tell us about where something came from. Um, once you also separate these two mechanisms, there are a couple of testable hypotheses that come out. One is that these mechanisms can explain the difference between consistent alignment constructions and constructions with inconsistent alignment. So reanalysis introduces the consistency, analogy entered inconsistency. I would include here that when it's nominative accusative, analogy can return consistency. It seems that analogical forces favor nominative accusative patterns. Uh, second hypothesis is the relevance of semantic motivations for different kinds of historical change. For reanalysis, it's not the meanings of the individual pieces, but it's the entire construction that's relevant. For analogy, it's the meanings of individual morphemes or patterns that's the most relevant. So there's a lot of work ahead to really test these hypotheses and really flesh out this program. Um, first, we need a lot more work in language documentation, conservation, and revitalization because minoritized indigenous languages all over the world are in danger. Most of them are not well documented. Typologically informed descriptions that get into the details we need to do a re reconstruction are relatively recent phenomenon. Um, so I would argue this is the most urgent work that a linguist can do. And I thank my South Americanist colleagues in particular for all that you're doing to bring these data uh, into the public domain. And additionally, to go back and help the peoples that speak these languages recognize the incredible value that these languages represent. Additionally, uh, historic studies using the comparative method uh, we need a lot of these. And as we reconstruct larger things like syntactic constructions, uh, we will be able to really address these kind these typological questions. And yes, it's less useful to the world, but it's really fun uh, and. When people say, why do you do this job? It's because it's really fun. And sometimes we can do good as, as well. So that's it. Thank you for uh, joining us today and uh, acknowledgements to various institutions that have helped me my work. Obrigado a todos amigos do Brasil. And I am open for questions. Oh. Your mute button is on. Okay. Thank you so much for this interesting speech uh, explanations on reanalysis. And uh, we have received many greetings from Sao Paulo, from Brazil, all around, from Brasilia. And uh, there is an interesting question from, uh, let me, Antonio Lafuria, I think he's from USP. Uh, he's asking, can these studies be carried out in the new Caribbean language creoles from countries like Suriname or French Guiana? Um, absolutely. I think the methodology works in any languages. However, um, now here's where I could uh, be greatly mistaken because, in fact, I've never worked with a Creole language or a language that has, that has been greatly affected by contact. So these methods would suggest it, it might be more difficult to find examples of clear examples of reanalysis from source constructions in that most constructions will presumably have been kept originally from uh, one or either the superstrate or the substrate language. Now, to the extent that they are truly innovating, my guess is reanalysis from lexical items and lexical constructions will be the, um, this will be the method by which uh, uh, you will see the creation of all of the different tense aspect, for example, well, aspect uh, constructions that start off. Um, but I should probably talk less about what I know so little about. Um, I would love to talk with you about it uh, at some length uh, and have a chance to throw out ideas and, and learn from your experience what does and does not work. Okay, I have a question myself. 
Um, in what sense is, is this work diachronic? Because those languages, they, they are not documented, are they? Mm -hmm. So you don't have a, you know, a time death of 100 years or 200 years to That's compare, true. you know, the constructions and to talk about diachronic, really, study. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, here we find the uh, interest of doing typology alongside the historical reconstruction. So the first assertion I would make is that the majority of historical linguistics, in fact, works with languages that are never attested. They work on the basis of languages that are attested and work backwards. Oh, what yes, is yes. nice is that Alongside reconstruction, we also have layers of attested change. Granted, the attested changes are not perfect. You don't have a complete record of any uh, uh, classical. Some check on the chat. Hmm? Okay, thank you. Uh, but uh -huh. but so. the point is that, well, let me, look, there's, there's actually a little more development there. The, the historically attested changes allow us to analogize, that is, we can see what kinds of changes happen in attested cases, and then we can extrapolate from those to the languages that have no attested change. And in fact, that is also the extrapolation we do when we go back in, say, Indo-European or in Sinitic studies or Sino-Tibetan from the oldest attested sources to earlier sources. So the reconstructions rely on what we observe in attested change. And that has unfortunately not been done enough in historical syntax. Oh, you are on mute again. Okay, uh, there's another question mm -hmm. here, just a minute. Um, a. L. Madrid, mm -hmm. are you listening? Considering all the inconsistence of alignment patterns in one language and the different patterns of change, can we speak of language types or should we work in terms of construction typology? I think you have already answered that. Yeah, actually though, I would go a bit farther. I find labels for languages and labels for constructions to be misleading. So when you talk about an ergative language, I, all that means is that one construction somewhere in there has one ergative marker, and now you can call it an ergative language and, and contrast that with Jirbal that almost doesn't have anything except ergative patterns. And the same thing is true of constructions. If you say, well, that's an ergative construction, okay, it has one ergative pattern in it. Now we'll call it an ergative construction, even though uh, it may have nominative uh, verb agreement, it may have nominative word order, it may have nominative control of coreference, but it has that one marker, so it's an ergative construction alongside a construction that is almost completely ergative, as in the Akawayo or the, the Jirbal or the Katukina examples. The only place where I think it's legitimate to use a label is to identify a given pattern internal to a given construction. I think from there, it's better to say this construction contains an ergative pattern. This language has ergative patterns, but to say it's an ergative language or an ergative construction, yeah, I, I'm not comfortable with it. Let's say it's very imprecise. Okay, uh, there's another question. Um, Joanna, I don't think it's a on a bar perhaps. Yeah, yes. Yeah, that's it. Just just a minute. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm thinking about your early slide where you present the difference between the motivations for negative versus accusative alignments. Mm -hmm. There you say that negative is motivated by, by past tense, while the accusative is motivated by non-past tense, or perhaps it said imperfect versus perfective. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it be more accurate to say that the accusative systems are neutral with regard to tense? Mm. Um. I 
I guess you could say that. Um, I wouldn't say motivated by necessarily, but I would say conditioned by. And actually, I, the example of Makushi would be an example where that's not the case. Uh, in Makushi, which I didn't show here, it was a... All instructions are urgent, absolute, non-past, including perfective and imperfective. Single nominative accusative construction, which is the progressive, which came from that same, um, um, that same locative uh, predicate source. And in that case, it's the ergative that is, call it unspecified for tensor aspect, and only the nominative accusative is specified for progressive aspect. So I'm not sure that you could quite make the overarching uh, abstract claim. Oh, okay. There are many messages thanking you a lot for this fascinating speech. Hmm. And um, is that for me? Any, you know, message thanking you for this fascinating hmm. speech. And I think we, we I'd like to to thank you again for this uh, participation in this Amrali project. To you all who have listened to him also, and to the interpreters, I think uh, maybe Libras, it's still in time to remind our colleagues to the importance of, of being associated, uh, uh, being a member of Amrali, uh, the Brazilian Linguistic Association. Professor Gaidia, thank you very much for being with us. And it's very complex and fascinating topic. I myself am very interested in reanalysis and analogical extension. But I, I worked with uh, the history of Portuguese. Ah, so you have you know. attested change. Yes, I, I did. Uh, but uh, these language are fascinating. You know, these internal reconstructions that you did, it's very difficult, very complex. Yeah. And, but I, I do need to say, I know that uh, Brian Joseph referred to grammaticalization as primarily internal reconstruction. And I do need to say that in this case, it's again important to distinguish the kind of work I'm doing. This is truly the comparative method applied to syntactic constructions. And the introduction to the 2020 volume describes how that works. Uh, this is comparative linguistics. And without, it, right? without the different related languages, we would not be able to discover many of the historical sources of these changes. Yeah. Uh, internal reconstruction is also fun. In the case of uh, linguistic isolates, I've also done some of that. Uh, oh, I and, see. But they are much less, let's say, I, I, less reliable in the sense that I don't trust them as much because you really don't know. All you have available is the evidence from a single language and yes. those uh -huh. few constructions that survived that are arguably, like basically when reanalysis creates a split, you see the source construction and you see the resultant mm -hmm. construction side by side. So you can say, oh, this one gave rise to that one. But maybe there was a third construction that gave rise to them both. You never know without seeing other languages that are related where you can really see what the old pattern was. Yeah, so I I'm sure, I'm Reconstruction sure. scares me. Uh -huh. It's still fun. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh. Uh, another thing is my uh, curiosity, uh, of course. Uh, do you uh, could you share with us uh, in, uh, your fieldwork experience, something of the this type of linguistics that you do? You know, go to these places, and uh, you know, can you share something of this? You know, the human side of the question, or I can. Um, unfortunately, I'm, I'm a bit embarrassed to admit it after seeing the modern methods of, of field work. Uh, my own work has rarely been directly connected with a single uh, community or a single people for very long. I've worked with 15 different Caribbean languages and uh, individual speakers of unrelated families. Um, what that means is I've done comparative work. So I worked from primarily from the Museo Paraense Emilio Gelci in northern Brazil, in Belém. And with their orientation, I knew which peoples were looking for a linguist to come work. And so I was able to go and 
put students to do it the right way. So uh, Petronila Tavares did a, a beautiful grammar of the Wayana language. Sergio Meira de Santa Cruz Oliveira did his grammar of TDO. But what I would do is go with them for a period of time and get them started. So the idea is you go and live with people. You develop the ability to have small daily conversations that those grow as you spend more time there. You collect natural speech as quickly as possible because you want to study not how people perform translation, but how people communicate with their subconscious uh, language facility. And so you spend time integrating and it's wonderful. You get to eat amazing foods. You get to become friends with people who have very different beliefs about the world from your own beliefs. And uh, on the side, every now and again, they get to say, you outsiders are so strange. I just say a sentence and now you're jumping up and down and screaming. <laughs> that would be the example when I went to a language that didn't have this innovative progressive, but I asked, I knew all the pieces from another language. So I just said, could you say something like this? And I made up a sentence in their language using the cognate morphology. And they said, oh, you speak our language. That means, and then they started talking and I found a source construction that maybe would never have been in a text because it was a very pragmatically marked, very rarely used. It had not become a progressive. It was just a, a marked way of saying, well, it was essentially, I am on my, my uh, working right now. And he says, I said, when would you say that? And he said, well, it doesn't mean I'm working. It means like my wife comes and says, hey, uh, I need some water. Could you run get some water? And it's like, you know, I'm on my working right now. I'm occupied. I can't get away. So it's a particular kind of work in progress for a particular purpose. And the joy of this kind of comparative work is you find what, what things mean in related languages that have not gone through the changes. And mm -hmm. that's what makes, that's why I said comparative work is magic in this kind of, of mm -hmm. historical work. Unfortunately for me, I, I'll, I'll say again, I admire the people who have a long-term commitment with a single community and who go back again and again and you build long-term relationships. I've tried to start doing that recently with a group that we used to know as Kachuyana, who, uh, were in Misaun Tirios in 1994 when I started working there. And they returned to their ancestral homeland on the Trombetas, uh, north of Santarén and a little bit west of Santarén, Dupara. And they are now called the Werikya. They have decided they want to have an education program, bilingual education. And so they somehow found me and asked me to come back to show them how I wrote their language back in the 90s. And so in negotiating with, with the bilingual school teachers, all of the people who were children when I first worked there, uh, they developed their own writing system now. They've begun writing cachillas, uh, primers for teaching, reading and writing, and they've started doing their own language documentation. And this to me right now is I think the most exciting part uh -huh. of is that long-term, you get to watch people grow up. And sadly, uh, just, Last week, I got to hear that yes, yes, yes. the first man I worked with, Honorio Cachuyana, uh, yeah. died. So you also get to have friends who go through their entire life cycle. Uh, are you ready to answer another question or you want to At finish your now? Let's ask, go ahead. Okay, okay. Uh, because there are two different ones. Uh, okay. Which one? Uh, could you comment more on the role Roberto Daniel Zari Zarikiei Zari Biondi? Mm. Could you comment more on the role position of grammaticalization in this mechanism-based approach to syntactic reconstruction? Um, I think of grammaticalization as a process that leads to an outcome, and it's a, a process meaning a sequence of changes. And at the end of that sequence, you have a grammatical morpheme. And in this traditional conception, you start with a lexical item that becomes that grammatical morpheme. Something like the word will in English, which meant want, goes through some changes and it becomes will the auxiliary, which means future. Um, that process 
uh, happens by means of exactly these two mechanisms. That is, not all examples of the source lexeme become a grammatical morpheme. Some of them remain source lexemes in their source constructions. It's the reanalysis of an entire construction that carries a lexical item first into a grammatical role. After that, it goes through analogical changes. It goes through reduction, topological reduction. It goes through a series of change reduction that lead to it becoming a grammatical morpheme or recognizable as a grammatical morpheme. So I actually think that grammaticalization as a process is driven by exactly these two mechanisms happening one you know, in iteration. So if you really look closely at grammaticalization, you are looking at these two mechanisms. And it's worth separating them in studies of grammaticalization as well. Because for example, motivated grammatical pathways where the meaning of the source gives rise to the meaning of the grammatical morpheme, those either contribute directly to the meaning of the source construction as in want, meaning something that hasn't happened yet. Therefore, uh, a want by clausal construction becomes a future monoclausal construction or they could uh, actually have unmotivated things like uh, I am doing of my needings. That of is not there for semantic reasons. It's not there to say, oh, this object is funny in some way. It's just doing is a noun. And in order to relate one noun to another noun, you need the possessive relationship. So I am on doing of my needings uses the possessive relationship to link the logical patient to that nominalized verb. So in this case, you see that the grammaticalization of of as an accusative marker has nothing to do with semantic motivation. That's why we need to be thinking about reanalysis and extension at the same time that we're thinking about grammaticalization. I, I think it's a mistake to separate the two. That said, uh, I really do disagree with Brian Joseph's uh, uh, conclusion in the talk he recently gave on Aberlin, where he said, Grammaticalization is neither a process nor a mechanism. It is not a mechanism. I have to agree with him there. It absolutely is a process in the same way that say evolution is a process. You start with one kind of animal, you end up with a different kind of animal. And the steps that it takes have their own mechanisms, which are replication and survival of the fittest. And those two mechanisms generate that process, but it is a process that has an outcome. And in the same way, grammaticalization is a process with an outcome driven by the mechanisms of reanalysis and analogy. <laughs> Sorry, I'm talking faster. I think I'm excited. Oh, thank, tell me thank, this thank, is what no, happened. it's good. It's good. Thank you so much for your fascinating speech. And uh, would you like to leave a message uh, for us? You have the final words. Ok. Bom, a todos os amigos no Brasil, do resto do, do mundo, eu sinto muito a falta de vocês. Eu sinto muito a situação em que nosso mundo caiu agora. Uh, força. Uh, e, e especialmente para os amigos indígenas que estão sofrendo bastante agora, mesmo no Brasil, mesmo nos Estados Unidos, Uh, que seja boa toda a, a, a sorte que vocês têm e que sobrevivam. Tá. Muito e... obrigada, muito obrigada pelas palavras em português e esperamos revê-lo brevemente. Ai, eu também espero. Muito obrigado a toda a força que vocês deram. And obrigada a você. I'm a member of Abralin. You're doing Por wonderful. favor. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. We have to finish now. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.